Welcome to Downpour.com's interview series. I'm Grover Gardner, and today it's my pleasure to be speaking with William Landay, author of the novel Defending Jacob. William is an award-winning author of two previous novels, The Strangler, the Los Angeles Times' favorite crime book of the year, and Mission Flats, winner of the Creasy Memorial Dagger Award for Best First Crime Novel. He has recently received high praise from numerous acclaimed authors for Defending Jacob, which released an audio simultaneously with the hardcover on January 31st, 2012, and uh, was also narrated by yours truly. Hi, Bill, and thank you for joining us today to talk to us on our uh, Audiobook Insider. Thank you for having me. Your new novel, Defending Jacob, just came out. It's uh, already gotten fantastic reviews from Booklist and a starred review from Publishers Weekly, as well as uh, recommendations from some very big name authors. What um, you you have you've had two previous books out, but this is your first um, courtroom drama. Actually, is that right? That is correct. Yes, I wrote two earlier novels that were uh, crime novels, but not courtroom novels. And what what? What was the idea of moving actually into the courtroom as opposed to just the law enforcement end? Now you're in the defense end, so to speak. What what prompted that move? It, it's a funny thing. I had been, for most of the 1990s, I was an assistant DA uh, in the Boston area. And so most of my experience with law enforcement was in the courtroom. I was a trial lawyer. Um, when I started writing it always seemed to me that the real action was out on the street. It wasn't in the courtroom. And so I just started uh, writing crime novels uh, that imagined the cases that I had handled. But it's part of the experience of being a prosecutor that you are inside the courthouse and you're really left to imagine what happened out there from police reports and from witnesses are telling you. It really didn't cross my mind that the the more dramatic aspect might actually be what happens inside the courtroom. It had been a very long time since there was a courtroom thriller that really took off. Uh, and it seemed to me that there was an opportunity there. I, I loved the classic courtroom thrillers. I loved Presumed Innocent, uh, whose imprint is all over this book, I think. And I thought that there was that the time was ripe to uh, to bring that back a little bit. The main character of the book is uh, an assistant district attorney, uh, Andy Barber, and he's put in the position of having to quit his job, essentially, or uh, remove himself, recuse himself, because his own son is accused of a murder, and then he participates in the defense of his own son. This is a family situation, a, a very tense and very taut one between himself and his son and his wife. What, how, did the, how did the family aspect come into it? Well, all books sort of develop slowly and morph slowly from, from the tiny seed of an idea. In this case, I had uh, been writing full-time for about, I suppose, seven or eight years by the time I started this book. So I had been out of the courtroom and out of law enforcement for many years by the time I started this project. And probably more importantly, I'd had uh, two kids. I have two little boys right now who are ages eight and 10. And so my life was really much more about family and about uh, bringing up these kids uh, than it was about law enforcement. And so there were these two strands time that I spent as a DA in law enforcement. And there was my current life as a full-time writer and, and as a father. And so the idea was to bring these two things together in my own life. And the, the other piece of that uh, also is that it always struck me that readers of crime novels don't live in the world of crime that they like to read about. You'll see ordinary housewives and accountants and and, and doctors and lawyers who read about criminals uh, quite happily and obviously <laughs> feel that they're getting something out of that. There's something in those stories that resonates with them and that uh, is meaningful to them. And I wanted to bring home to these readers that 
the crime world that you are reading about, the source of all that drama and all that uh, evil is not out there. It's not in some other world. It's part of human nature and it's part of the world that we live in. It's part of us. And so I wanted to tell a crime story that was set in the world that my readers would recognize and would feel is very familiar. And to, I wanted to bring that home so that they wouldn't think of crime novels as a fantasy story, but as a story that was setting that was set in their own world. Was there a real life incident that inspired this? Something you know ripped from the headlines, as they say, or or did this just kind of come out of your own family experience? Uh, well, it certainly didn't come out of my family experience. <laughs> the, um, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, the uh, there wasn't a single case that it took off from. I think a lot of people hear the uh, the basic facts of the story and they think about Columbine, but it's really not a Columbine situation at all. It's really a, a small kind of private crime uh, that happens in this case. Um, there have been a lot of kid-on-kid -kid murders and kid-on-kid -kid violence uh, that have made the news. And some of those stories did get uh, spun into the mix in one way or another. Um, there, there have also been a couple of cases involving um, violence that seems to run in families. And there was in particular a very uh, famous case about a, a New York detective, a Long Island uh, detective who was the son of a murderer. And then that detective's own son was accused of murder. So the violence seemed to have skipped a generation, but still seemed to run in that family. It was the subject of a very famous uh, Esquire magazine article by uh, Mike McAlary, who was a, a very well-known uh, crime writer in New York. And um, I remember being struck by that article. It came out in the late 90s. I think it was 97 or 98. And that was the first time I, I had ever heard a suggestion uh, that there might be such a thing as a murder gene. Uh, the gene could be that uh, violence could be transmitted genetically, that it could be inheritable. Um, and that got my imagination working. That actually predated some of the science that has since caught up to that story. We've only mapped the, the human genome in the last 10 years. Um, but the science is starting to back up that suggestion. And of course, that is uh, that gets a storyteller's imagination going. It's such a, a rich and haunting idea. The the narrator is uh, the storyteller is Andy himself, yes. the first person narrative, and I don't want to give away too much here, but I do want to touch on something that I think is very interesting and very pertinent to the experience of reading the book and trying to figure out the story. He's not. Would it be fair to say that he's not a reliable narrator? In the um, classic, sort of the classic sense, we, we're yeah. not sure we're getting the whole picture. Yeah, I'm very wary of that term, unreliable narrator. Okay. Um, because to me, I think Andy is very reliable. What's one of the interesting aspects of the book is that Andy is relating the story to the reader as he is testifying about it before a grand jury. And so he is on the witness stand as he is recollecting and retelling this story. So Andy himself is very upfront about when he might be hedging, what are the limits of what he is willing to say and what he might be holding back. But he never misrepresents anything and he certainly never misrepresents to the reader what's going on. Uh, however, he is in a situation where he's sitting on the witness stand as he's speaking and so to some extent, he is unreliable because he's shading his testimony. Uh, but the fact that that's built into the story, that you know he's being interrogated as he's speaking, really puts the reader on edge. It gives them fair warning that, you know, you really need to pay attention to what he's saying. And I think if people go back and really look at the book, they'll see that he wasn't unreliable at all. Uh, he simply allowed the reader to make suppositions that, that weren't necessarily justified, mm. which is to say okay. I think the play is fair. Okay. 
And that, that's um, a- go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, that, that's important. I feel like in in a mystery, it's it's a cheat to have a, a, a narrator who simply misleads the reader. You have to play fair with the reader. Um, at the same time, it's important just for the reader's pleasure to provide surprises and twists and things that they don't see coming. And at this point, so late in the life of the genre, and with readers so smart, they've seen so many mysteries and and now, even, you know, there's cop shows every night on TV. You can see a law and order running in syndication practically 24 hours a day. It's very hard to surprise these readers, to surprise this audience, which has become so savvy. And so you've got to reach deep into the bag of tricks to, to pull out a real surprise. But it's that sense of surprise that is that I, as a reader, really enjoy. I think the point of a great book is to delight the reader in ways that that they haven't been delighted before. And I think that that really relies on surprise and it's a part of the pleasure of this book. Well, without giving anything away, I will say that the twist at the end is very surprising, Mm. but it's also very well prepared. The groundwork is very well laid. It's, you know, it doesn't come out of nowhere. And again, I think part of the part of the way it's so well set up uh, is the fact that we we come to understand that he he's grappling with the story as he's telling the story. Um, yeah. That that, I, I, that he's struggling he's struggling to find a way. I th- I think you're absolutely right. He's he's he wants to be honest, um, but he does have to be careful because he is testifying. Right. Uh, but he is, he's as honest as he knows how to be. And yet still, there's a sense that the, the surprise at the end comes as a surprise, as a surprise because we're, um, we, we still don't, we still don't have everybody's point of view. Right. We only, we only really have his point of view to rely on. Right. And I, I think so, the, the, the reason, <laughs> the reason it works, the reason you're sort of willing to go that far with Andy is that the reason he's torn is that he's a father and this is his family that's come under fire. And when he's on the witness stand talking about this case, he's not just talking about any criminal case. He's talking about his own wife and his own child. And he wants to do the right thing. He wants to be a good parent and he wants to be a good person. It's just not clear to him what that means. And I think that's something that will resonate with, with a lot of parents and with a lot of readers who, you know, we all want to want to do the right thing, but it's not always clear, you know, what is the right thing for, for a good parent to do. Um, the other piece that I think makes it interesting is that even though he's talking about his own son, he doesn't necessarily know everything about his own son. He doesn't necessarily know who Jacob Barber actually is. And again, that's something that I think a lot of parents and a lot of spouses and a lot of people will will recognize the, the difficulty of of knowing anyone else, even your own child, um, who who is part of you, and yet at the same time who's another person who's a human being, every bit as complex as you are, and harboring just as many secrets. We all know, we've all had the experience of of talking with a with a teenager and for those of us who are parents of talking with our own child and wondering what's actually going on inside that head of yours. And so some of that is happening with Andy too. He just, he just doesn't really know who his child is exactly. I think, I think that touches on a very deep seated fear uh, for every parent, especially in the teenage years when there's so much going on and there's so much and they naturally teenagers tend to withdraw and tend to sort of defend themselves against interference from their parents and the sense that you, you, do you really know what they're doing, where they are, who they're hanging around with? Right. Uh, and I think it, yeah. it portrays that very effectively, uh, the sense that, uh, that Andy is surprised to learn many things. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's true. I think that that's part of the reason that people are responding to this book as strongly as they are. Uh, Jacob is not a monster. Uh, he's not a, a serial killer. He's not a, a psycho. 
when you meet him, he is very much like a lot of teenagers that you'll meet, only more so. And his his secretiveness and his moodiness and his uh, withdrawn nature is something that a lot of parents are going to recognize. Uh, and it's only the exaggeration of these of these very common teenage traits that begins to get Jacob into trouble and that begins to sort of take on a, a sinister tone when it's in the context of a murder case. I'm not going to ask you to answer this, except <laughs> just to confirm, do you yourself, do you know whether Jacob is guilty or innocent? Sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's all I wanted to know. That's it. But I, I think we're, I'm, I'm going to leave that for the reader or listener uh, to figure out, because I think that's one of the beauties of the book is you're constantly um, kind of flipping back and forth right, emotionally right. on that on that issue. Um, courtroom drama. Yeah, I was watching a, an old uh, movie the other day from the 30s, and there was a courtroom scene where uh, someone's accused of murder and I, 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 it was ridiculous because all of a sudden he was on the stand for murder, you know, accused of murder. There was no evidence, but somehow someone testifies and everybody says, well, he's guilty. But then the ex-wife gets up and she goes crazy on the stand and confesses to the whole thing sort of out of out of nowhere. Notoriously, courtroom dramas can often be a little like sports books or other things where a knowledgeable reader will look at it and go, oh, no, 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 yeah. that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think they're very difficult to pull off. Um, there's so many temptations to kind of twist things around so that it's entertaining or it's convenient for the plot or, yeah. you know, but this is very convincing. And so how how concerned were you with making sure that because the whole thing is almost almost all of it is set in the courtroom or revolves around the courtroom scenes mm -hmm. that you there was seems to be a great deal of accuracy in there. Did you how much did you have to pull out of your own experience to to do that? Well, I think what you pull out of your own experience is just a fluency with the system. Uh, it's not a, a particular case that that was in my own experience. Um, I think one reason courtroom stories are hard is that most, most storytellers want to build to a climax that includes a resolution. They want to remove all doubt. And that's why you always have this uh, confession from the witness stand, which <laughs> never happens in court, because the storyteller wants, wants that satisfying climax where the doubt simply vanishes and the 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 audience is allowed to feel comfortable because they've achieved that sense of resolution. Um, in court, it never works that way. Even when you have a verdict, it comes back guilty or not guilty, and you still walk out feeling that there is some bit of doubt. You still don't know for sure what happened. You know, when the judge gives the jury its instructions, he says, you have to find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, not beyond any doubt, because everything that we do is subject to, to some measure of doubt. So as you become more experienced as a, as a lawyer and you go from trial to trial, your tolerance for this doubt grows. You simply accept that that's a limitation of the court system. None of us uh, none of the professionals who were there, the judge, the lawyers, the court officers, even the police officers, none of us were there to actually see the crime. And so even if you reach 99% certainty about what happened and 99% confidence in the verdict, there's always that nagging 1% of doubt that, that always, it always used to eat me up as a lawyer. Uh, and, and it simply can't be eliminated. It's it's built into the system, but it's it's not built into novels and stories about the system because it's viewed as antithetical to ordinary sto storytelling, which builds to climax and resolution. Uh, an unresolved story is is perceived as intolerable by the audience. Um, 
I don't see it that way. And I feel that uh, the doubt that these that this family takes away from the trial, and I won't spoil the climax, but the doubt that they take from the trial is actually fuel for for the rest of the story and and for for what they must have been thinking, what will the rest of our lives be like? Not knowing for sure. And that sort of leads into the final act of the book, which I I understand your hesitation to talk about, but um, but again, it's part of the court system, and I wanted it to be part of this book too. Well, the the trial comes to an end as sort of the result of a, a extraordinary intervention, mm-hmm. uh, which I won't reveal. But uh, so yes, there's room there. You, I think that's very masterfully set up in the sense that the trial ends, but it, as you say, it doesn't answer you know, the questions. Right. As no trial ever does, because there's always, you always walk away with that little doubt. Is there something in the works coming up? Uh, There's always something in the works. I'm, uh, I'm hesitant to talk about it, but it, uh, I, it's a cardinal sin to talk about a book in progress. Uh, but I will say it's in the same, uh, general ballpark as defending Jacob. It's, it's another, Another story of a murder involving an ordinary family in an ordinary town, uh, but very different. And in the sense that it uh, it's about how a family moves on and what the limitations of of our sense of justice are, and how how a victim's family uh, reaches some sense of peace afterwards, and what what it is that they uh, that they need to move forward. So I, I hate to be vague about it, but to be too specific uh, is bad luck for the book and, and also inaccurate only because the book develops as you write it. And so whatever I told you now would be inaccurate by by next Tuesday. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Well, I have to tell you, uh, uh, having narrated the book, um, and I wouldn't normally bring this up, but um, it, it was extraordinary. I found it fascinating, moving. Um, it was quite an interesting tightrope to walk, uh, telling Andy's story for him. And I found myself um, always tempted to try to color it or, you know, take it, make some assumption or draw some conclusions. But I really had to fight against that because um, th- there's too much going on and there's too yep. much that we don't know and that he doesn't know and that he admits he doesn't know and that he doesn't understand. Yeah. And uh, so I had to just kind of let, you know, let it pull me along. And uh, right. it was quite an experience. What's interesting about the story, so, it, it, the fact that it's told in the first person is, is always seductive. You always, you hear that person's voice in your head and he's speaking in the first person. He's saying, I, I, I. And so he seems to be speaking directly to you. And yet in this case, you have a narrator who's a very, very smart, experienced guy. And yet, yet he's very frank about the, the limits of his own knowledge and, and the limits of what he can tell you. And so it's very hard to, to go around him and try to outguess him because he's very frank about, about the limits of what he knows. So it, it just adds a, a layer of, of complexity and interest to the story that's, that's, that's often missing. Thank you very much for talking with us today. This was a great discussion. Uh, the book is fantastic. Uh, not only a wonderful plot and plenty of fantastic twists, but also a, a really gripping, realistic, and, um, and, and compelling uh, um, courtroom drama and family drama as well. Uh, I think it has so many, so many great things going for it. So we're really looking forward to uh, uh, hearing from our, our listeners about it. Thank you so much for your time and we really appreciate it. Happy to do it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us for this exclusive interview. You can find all of Blackstone Audio's titles and more at downpour.com.